The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we'll be discussing I2C, SPI, and RS-232, which are some very common interfaces useful to engineers and hobbyists alike. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, a follow-up on taking Ghost Squad Pinball to the Midwest Gaming Classic. It was a lot of fun, a ton of people got to play it, and the best part was, legendary pinball designer Steve Ritchie himself played it and said that he liked it on the Facebook page. So that was like, wow, that's really cool. So uh, yeah, now we just gotta uh, redesign it a little bit and get it ready for production. Interfaces. What are interfaces? Well, interfaces are predefined ways to communicate between electronics. Uh, for instance, you might have a microcontroller here and you wanna to talk to a temperature sensor. How do you do that? You do that with an interface. The temperature sensor will have an interface such as uh, SPI and you're like, oh, that is the way I have to communicate between my devices. So why do you need interfaces? Well, microcontrollers don't have that much I.O. Even a really large one, there's always a limit. So you're gonna run out of I.O. eventually if you hook up enough stuff. Interfaces gives you a way to use less I.O. And the more important reason why you need them is because most external devices require an interface. If you have an EEPROM, it's not gonna hook up with a bunch of individual parallel wires. Well, it might have 20 years ago, but not anymore. It's going to say, hey, this is an I2C EEPROM. So we're like, oh, I need the I2C interface in order to even use this thing. So that's what it boils down to. You need interfaces because to hook up anything beyond like an LED to a microcontroller, you're gonna need an interface. Whether or not you realize it, you've seen us use these interfaces before on the show. The robot luggage, for instance, used RS-232. The hand sanitizer used SPI to communicate with the SD card to write data. And the can cooler, for instance, used I2C to read the temperature of the can. What are these interfaces? We'll discuss that now. Here are the three very common interfaces we're going to go over in today's episode. I2C, which stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit. It has two wires, including clock and data. SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, or sometimes Interchange. That has three wires, plus one chip select wire. And the third one, the oldie but goodie, RS-232, recommended standard 232. One or two wires with no clock. We'll start with an I2C example. I2C will have a master device that has serial clock and serial data lines on it. These lines will almost always have pull-up resistors on them. Sometimes it'll work without the pull-up resistors, but it's not a bad idea to put them in. Then in this example, we have three slave devices. You can have up to around 120, I want to say. Uh, each one of these devices has a serial data and serial clock line of its own. So here's how it works. The master device sends out a device ID command on the bus, like uh, wake up device zero. Device zero is like, oh, that's me, and it acknowledges back. The other devices don't do anything. Once this is like, oh, I'm talking to device zero. Device zero, here is your command. Device zero is like, okay. And then the master device will either do a read or write data or some sort of command to the device with that particular slave ID. So it's all based off of the device ID. That's always the first thing you send out onto the bus. The advantage of that is you can have a ton of different devices on one two-wire bus, which saves you I.O. However, it's slow, and oftentimes if you have different devices, the manufacturers just kind of pull numbers out of a hat for what their ID is, so you might have conflicts. So, few pins, slow speed. Now let's look at the I2C bus in action. We have a small IC squared device here. This is an IR proximity sensor. It sends out an IR infrared light, and then it sees how much reflects back into its sensor, and therefore it can detect how close something is. It's a very small sensor, but I was able to, able to wire it up to this breadboard here, so. Off the sensor, we have the two I squared C lines. I squared C has serial data and serial clock, usually called SDA and SCL and you need pull-up lines on each of those. Pull-up line is where you have a 10K resistor. I always use 10K. 10K resistor connected to positive power going into the line, so its default state is always high. So if you're having trouble with your I2C bus, make sure you have pull-up resistors on both the lines. And those go into the Arduino here, and the Arduino is reading them and putting the data out on the screen. 
We already discussed how we have to ask for the data, so that's already been programmed in. So if I move my finger here, it's actually a 16-bit value, but I just am looking at the lower bits. You can see the number change as I move my finger back and forth from the sensor. I squared C lets you put multiple devices on the same two-wire bus, which is a great advantage. One disadvantage, though, is it's kind of slow. You've seen how many different calls you have to make just to read data off of it. But if you don't need a lot of speed, it can be a great solution, and it's a very common interface. Our next example is SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. SPI has three basic connections, master out, slave in, master in, slave out, clock, and then the number of chip selects. You need a chip select line for every device on the bus. Unlike I2C, you can't just put all the devices on one bus and address them with that. You have to actually manually activate the devices with an enable line. So let's say you wanna to talk to this device, slave one. And let's say slave one is active low. You set its chip select line to low and this one would be high, which means you're talking to this guy and this guy isn't gonna be doing anything. So what you do after you do the chip select, you send the command, so you would clock that out, master out, slave in, comes out of the master, into the slave. Master out, slave in. Slave will also send you back some bytes. They may be null data, but whenever you shift something out, something's always shifted back in. Interchange, that's where the interchange comes from. So after you send a command, let's say you're like, read memory position five, then you just clock a bunch of null zeros into slave one, and it'll return you the data you want. So again, it's always an interchange. Once you've got the data out of slave one, let's say you set it back to being high, you wanna read this guy, you would set him to being active low, and then your bus would be talking to this guy, and this guy would be ignored. So yes, you're always putting bits in and getting them out in the same clock cycle, although you can ignore the bits you get in because they're null data, basically. SPI is faster than I2C, it's also just as common. However, having to have a chip select line is kind of a disadvantage. Are these donuts slow fat? Jim, can you unsend an email? Who's the new girl? What's wrong with business casual? Is Carl joining the call? Who keeps taking my sandwich? Do you think I'd make a good stuntman? Have you guys seen Carl this week? Did we get those bonuses yet? Will this software really work? How do you remove a virus? Getting straight answers to all your questions at work. Where is everybody? Not as easy as it should be. Getting answers to product and technical questions from a team of engineering experts, definitely easier. Discover how we're listening to your feedback and building a better experience. Oh, Carl doesn't work here anymore. There's an SPI library in the Arduino software and pretty much any microcontroller you're going to use is going to have an SPI library. It's very, very common. However, when interfacing with this particular temperature gauge, I noticed a few glitches, which I'm gonna take you through now. Here on the screen, we have include SPI, that includes our library. You define chip select. As we mentioned, you have to select which SPI device you want to run. And we make chip select and output, and then we start SPI mode. Here we have something weird, it's set data mode. It refers to the phase of the clock and when the data is shifted in or out. And there's four different modes, zero through three. And as it turns out, this uh, thermometer doesn't use a standard mode. So it didn't, this didn't work until I set SPI mode one. So that tripped me up. So if your device isn't working, try setting different data modes. I couldn't really find it in the data sheet either. I just had to basically try all three or all four until they worked. All right, so here's the main loop. Uh, when you want to talk to the SPI device, you pull your chip select line high or low. Your data sheet will tell you if it's active high or active low. This one is active high, so that means we go from zero to one. And while chip select is one, that's where we do all our SPI business. In SPI, as we mentioned, everything is a transfer. So if I'm sending eight bits, I'm getting back eight bits. And I might not want these bits that I get back, but I need to send in a command. It's an interchange. Sometimes people actually say serial peripheral interchange as well, instead of interface. So here we're sending it hex 80, which means, hey, we want to write the control register. And then we're sending it all zeros. 
The default state of this temperature gauge is to not continuously take temperatures. So by setting all the bits of the control register to zero, we're telling it to continuously take temperatures. We just have to do that once, but we have to do it when it boots up because its default state is to not continuously give you a temperature. Then we just have a while one here, which will do a loop. We delay it uh, 200 milliseconds because the temperature reading actually takes 150 milliseconds as it turns out. Again, we pull the line high, so now we're talking to it again. We transfer it to in hex, which is also two in decimal. And that basically means, hey, we wanna read from memory position two, which contains the most significant bit side of the temperature, because we don't, we're not looking for the decimal here, we just want the solid temperature. Then we do byte temp equals SPI transfer, so we're sending it null data, and we're gonna get back the data we want from memory position two, which in this case is the temperature. Then we turn off the SPI right here. Then we convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and then we print it out and loop. So we'll flash this to the uh, Arduino and then we'll show you an example. Here is the SPI temperature sensor, wonderfully hooked up to this Arduino. Again, it's a service mount part, so I just solder it the best I could. Basically, it's using the SPI bus, which is actually the same thing you use to flash an AVR chip. So it's hooked up to the SPI bus here and it's uh, setting this data. So on the screen here, we can see the current temperature saying 62 right now. So if I touch it with my fingers, it should warm up because I am not a robot, despite what you may have heard. And it goes up in temperature. So what I learned with the SPI bus, at least with this chip is, you have to set the mode sometimes or it doesn't work. Another great example of SPI buses are uh, SD cards. They have two modes actually. There's a high speed mode, which is what your digital camera may use. You need a license for that. But in any sort of like microcontroller application, they almost always use SPI mode as well. The last interface we're gonna look at today is RS-232, recommended standard 232. It's pretty simple to use. You have a master device, transmit and receive lines over here receive and transmit lines. And notice how they are crisscrossed. So transmit here is receive here. Transmit here is receive here. It's pretty easy to use. There's other lines on the standard, but we don't really need those anymore. Uh, some disadvantages of it though, it's um, slower. Also, it has uh, no clock, asynchronous connection. So it's prone to interference, but nine times out of 10, it works just fine. For our RS-232 demonstration, we're going to use this FTDI chip. It's called the FTDI RS-232. It takes your USB signals, like from your computer, and turns it into old school serial logic. I should mention RS-232 actually uses positive and negative voltages, like in the 12 volt range. That's old school, so it'll go over long distances. This, it's the same kind of format, but it uses zero to five volts for its levels instead. And for my demonstration, I've got hooked up to an EMIC2 module. I got this from uh, Parallax, and this is a speech synthesis module. So RS-232 is really simple. Uh, it just basically is, um, it's data packages where it has a stop bit and an end bit. You've probably seen that before in your old school modems and whatnot. And it's asynchronous, which means there's no clock. So there's basically two lines, transmit and receive. So if you have a transmit, receive here, transmit, receive, you wanna have transmit, receive backwards. So receive goes to transmit and transmit goes to receive on your two different devices. So I've hooked it up with some jumpers here. So all this is is acting like an, uh, an adapter. Most full-size PCs still have RS-232 ports inside of them, the kind where you hook the headers up and then you go to your uh, nine pin adapter, but you know, USB adapter is fine. So RS-232 is usually uh, done with just uh, simple commands and settings. In this case, I wanna find my COM port, COM25, and then this thing runs at 9600 blob, which is very common, eight, one, parity, okay. And uh, sometimes this is important, what you append, like when I type something and then I hit return, what does it put on the end? So I'm gonna have it append uh, carriage return and line feed. That should be fine. Okay, let's delete this. So I have a command set. Pretty much any RS-232 device you have is going to have a you know a list of commands. And it's usually alphanumeric, and it also might return something too. So if I wanna make this talk, I have an S immediately followed by the text. Then I send it. Let's see, I can also increase the volume, and that's a command V, and then up to, let's try 12. Then we'll do this again. Hello. There's a little more volume. Hello. The universe is large. The 
The universe is large. And there we have Stephen Hawking as a guest star. So, uh, I don't know, there's not much you can really say about RS-232. It's uh, very old, but it's still used in a lot of different places. It can be kind of slow, and of course there's no clock, so, you know, it's prone to errors and whatnot, but it works, and, you know, it's found everywhere. In closing, let's use the Raspberry Pi as an example where you can use these interfaces in your own projects. The Raspberry Pi has input-output headers here. It has eight general-purpose input-output lines. However, that's not a whole heck of a lot. But it does have an SPI bus, an I squared C bus, and an RS-232 connection. So you can use multiple devices, as we've shown today, on that single bus, greatly expanding the I.O. capabilities of the Raspberry Pi. So that's just one example of how it can be used to expand your projects. Buses! Today's viewer question comes from the real super goofus who asks, did you take any classes in electronics? The answer is no, I'm completely self-taught but I wish I had. However, the Element 14 community and Google search will get you a long ways as well. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll start working on a dog treat dispenser you can remotely control over the web, complete with live video feed of your pooch, and join his or her milk bone. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.